Sir David, you must know as well as I do that a merger is the best option for your shareholders. Call a spade a shovel, man. It's a bloody takeover. Is that the 88? Yes, sir. Good. Nothing but the best tonight. It's a celebration. Oh, I'll need a pack of cigarettes. And you better let us have a look at a couple of menus. It went well. Very well. How are the kids? Give them a big hug from me. Look, they want me early for a press conference, so I'm, I'm going to stay in town. I'll get the publicity over with, and I'll see you tomorrow night. I love you, too. Bye. I know you don't. Just call me Pat. Whatever you say, Pat. Good evening, Mr. Hart. Good evening, Bobby. If I could just have a word with you in private. This lady is a guest of mine. Of course, Mr. Hatton. I hope you have a pleasant night, Cap. I do credit cards.
Pat, it's time we got going. Pat? Wish me luck. Don't worry, it's in the back. Most recently, I've been fundraising on behalf of the Women's Royal Hospital Trust. I think you have the details. It's the most impressive curriculum of time, Mrs. Kavanagh. You're more than qualified for the London liaison job. Perhaps even a little too much so. I am um, looking for a new challenge, Monsieur Kaplan. I think this position with the European Union Aid Administration Fund could be it. Controversial business tycoon Patrick Hutton was discovered early this morning in a luxury suite at London's Caxton International Hotel. Police said later they were treating the case as murder. Hutton has long been one of Britain's most forceful city figures. Yesterday's EKCG taker was the latest in a long line of aggressive moves by his company, Hutton Electronics. And Lewis. Yeah. You look a mess. How did you get in the next state? Plain Scrabble. You know how rough it can get. What do you want? We want to ask you a few questions about your movements last night. I didn't know the vice squad were making house calls these days. It's not vice, Annie. It's murder. My kid, Tracy. Where is she? My sister Diane looks after her. If I was you, Annie, I'd start making plans for adoption. Hello? Don't tell me. Face is familiar. It'll come to me in a minute. Very funny, Dad. Dad! Yeah, I'm sure I would have remembered. How's Luke these days? He's fine. We're not getting married, but he's promised to provide for the baby. Oh. Touché. <laughs> Haven't seen Luke recently. Somehow the sofa doesn't look quite the same without Luke planted on it. Dad, when you were mum, well, I mean, have you always been sure you'd be the same forever? Well, nothing stays the same. It's just that I realised that no matter what changed, nobody could ever make me happier. If you find someone like that, you hang on to them as hard as you can. Luke thinks because we're going to different universities, we'll drift apart. Well, what do you think? I think if we do, then it means we didn't love each other enough. 
Hi, Mom. Hi, Mom. Bye, Dad. You know that um, European aid job? Sure, yeah. You know, we were overqualified or too senior or some rubbish. Well, they've just got back in touch. For the London job? No. <laughs> no that's the odd bit. They want to interview me for chief executive. The big cheese. It's a fantastic opportunity. <laughs> I mean, it's gigantic, Jim. The budget's astronomical. The, um, the head office is in Strasbourg. Well, that's brilliant. Well, um, they're going to get back in touch with a date. Things back home. All right, you know. Didn't change much. <laughs> you're on our side, you. Bet on the talk of the town. You didn't have to be like this. You could have gone up in the mean, world. If without... I worked really hard, got a couple of GCSEs, might have ended up plucking chickens in the pie factory. It's a job. I've got a car that cost me 20 grand, paid for. I own flat, nice clothes. I go on holiday in the West Indies. Money's not everything. You're happy enough to get what I pay to look after her. Every penny you give me goes on her. Kids cost a fortune. Well, you wouldn't know that, would you? I'll tell you what they're all saying back home, Annie. They're all saying you did it. And what do you say? I say they're wrong. You might be a lot of things, but you're not a killer. Here. She drew it for you. Last year, Frank, it was quite appalling. I've really felt so humiliated in my entire life. It was something of a debacle. It was a disgrace. I don't like losing, James. Oh, it's meant to be a bit of fun, Jeremy. Fun? You call being soundly thrashed by a dim-witted bunch of oiks and yokels fun? I tell you this, if we don't beat Great Chartham this year, questions will be asked. I think the annual Chambers cricket match is meant to be a social event, Jeremy. A grand day out. Winning is not the main thing. Winning is everything. I can't for the life of me see the point of playing a game unless you intend to grind the other fellow into the dust. Trust I can rely on you to open the batting? If you think I'm up to it. Peter, you'll stand umpire again this year, will you? The thought of it's the only thing that keeps me going during the long winter months, Jeremy. Have you heard? I'm against you two in the Crown and Lewis. Looks very jolly. Do I detect a note of overconfidence? Look at the facts, James. It's either your tart or the tooth fairy in the dinner. I'd like to go through a few points you made in your statement this morning. Last barrister I met liked to dress in women's panties and call me mummy. How fascinating. I wonder if it's anybody we know. You say that you met Mr. Hutton at this club at about 10.30. Did you tell him you were a prostitute? I didn't have to. He knew. 
Are you saying that Patrick Hutton was a man who had experience with prostitutes? It was obvious. He talked about the girls he'd been with, things he liked to make them do. But he didn't mention any names? No. He didn't give me any addresses either, funnily enough. What did he actually say to you? He said that he slept with tarts because it meant that he was still being faithful to his wife. Tarts don't count. A lot of married men think that way. So, when you got back to the hotel... Are you married, Mr Kavanagh? We have a great deal to get through, Miss Lewis. Can we press on? Are you faithful to your wife? Is she faithful to you? <laughs> Mr. Kavanagh is a very busy man, Annie. I didn't say you could use my first name, Mr. Edzard. Did I ever get to you? Walking into the worst moment in people's lives and then calmly stepping out of it again? Do I actually care who we are? What we're going through? Let me ask you a question, Ms. Lewis. Are you good at what you do? Screwing blokes, yes. Do you ever get emotionally involved with the men who employ you? And here was me thinking we'd have nothing in common. You say in your statement that you defended yourself when Mr Hutton attacked you. What did you do exactly? I just tried to fight him off. And I scratched his face. And I remember his nose was bleeding. He let me go, so I just grabbed my stuff and ran for it. What time was this? About one o'clock. The forensic evidence suggests that Mr. Hutton died between three and four. If we could definitely place you somewhere else at that time, we'd be in better shape. The taxi driver saw me. That's no good to us, I'm afraid. He thinks it was late. He's got me mixed up with somebody else. Did you see anyone when you left the hotel? No. Mr. Day, the duty manager, says he saw you leaving after three. He's a bloody liar. Why would he lie? Because he runs his own girls. And I won't give him a cut. Can we call any evidence about that? <laughs> he must be joking. You're sure you didn't see anybody when you got home? Nobody at all? How the hell did I know I was going to need an alibi? You know, just for, a, just for a moment there, I thought you were letting it get under your skin. That's ridiculous. Of course it is, James. Do you think any of these hotel girls would talk to Edgar? Well, I don't know, you know, they're professional women. We're not talking about a quick bonk under the railway arches. You know, these are smart, sophisticated women. She hasn't got much if they won't. What makes you such an expert on ladies of the night, anyway? Just a keen student of human nature, James. <laughs> James! I bring glad tidings of great joy for the Queen of the Night. The Crown is prepared to accept manslaughter. The CPS a little uncertain of its ground, after all, Peter. Generous is the word I choose. It's good offer, James. She ought to take it. <laughs> Not if she didn't do it. Ah, consider the likely scenario, James. I wake from a drunken sleep. I turn on the light. There she is, caught red-handed, pocketing the loot. I leap from the bed. In her panic, she turns, grabs the nearest heavy object to hand, and smashes me with it. Down I fall. Bash, 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 she goes in the heat and confusion of the moment. Convincing? Perfectly. Only she said it didn't happen. Faced with life in jail for murder, of course she does. But manslaughter, James? Nine years out in five, probably? That's not so bad for a young woman. Well, I'll put it to her, but to be honest... I almost hope she does reject it. After all, it's a long time since you and I were again each other. Well, I think our Annie's ship has just come in. You reckon she'll grab it? Quicker than Joan of Arc with a bucket of water. Five years. Something like that. With good behaviour and parole. 
And what if I turn it down? If they find you guilty, life. 12 years at least, probably longer. What do you think I should do? I would advise you to think very carefully. Undoubtedly, the prosecution can piece together a, a pretty convincing connection linking you to the murder. And what have I got? Hodden's character. He was obviously a man who'd made enemies over the years. There's the disputed timings. Mr. Day, the duty manager. It's something to go on. I'd be crazy not to take it, wouldn't I? The problem is, Mr. Kavanagh, I didn't do it. I'm innocent. In that case, I couldn't advise you to plead guilty. So, it's up to you now, Mr. Kavanagh. No, it's up to both of us. The impression you make on that jury will be of great importance. You mean you'd like me to look as if hot and dying were a deep personal loss? He was a bastard. Just one more pig at the trough. He had it coming. Juries try to be fair, Ms. Lewis, but they're human. And they are swayed by appearances. I could put on my old girl guide uniform. You think it'd make a good impression? That might not be a very good idea. We don't want to overexcite the judge. I'm going to lose sometime, Mr. Kavanagh. We'll do our best. Good luck, Miss Lewis. Long time since I trusted a bloke, Mr. Kavanagh. Thank you, Miss Lewis. I'm flattered. Don't be. I've always been a lousy judge of men. I'm on the early plane Friday. I'll be back Sunday afternoon. Sorry about missing the big Chambers day out. I don't know how you can bear it. <laughs> Look, <clears throat> Lizzie, we've got to talk about this job. Let's cross that bridge when we come to it, shall we? Well, we've got to think about the kids. I, I know Kate's going off to university, but what about Matt? Jim, you know I wouldn't do anything if I thought Matt would suffer. Look, there's no point in discussing this until we know what's happening. But are you going to take the job if they offer it? I don't want to think about that now. I just feel as if I'm being pulled in too many different directions. Well, you going off to France isn't going to help that problem, is it? Thanks very much for your support. It was just an observation. I didn't mean it the way it sounded. Lizzie! Look, uh, I'm sorry about the other night. I know. That's not the point, though, is it? What is worrying you? I can't help wondering, this job, is it about you or about us? I know we've had our rough patches, but... If I was going to leave you, Jim, don't you think I'd tell you? Something's hard to say after 20 years. I have to get a complaint. It's just that I, I keep asking myself, are we strong enough? The question you should be asking yourself is, are you? I'm sorry to see you in this, Miss Annie. But I mean, they ain't gonna send you down with this, you know. Once you get out, we, we could spend some time together. You know, you and me, little Tracy, go on holiday or something, be nice, like old times. I'm clean now, I'm on the way, don't I? You look like shit. The thing is, Annie, is, it, is I was just wondering if, like, you could. Like, lend me a bit of dosh. I thought you might have some money stacked away somewhere. Just a time now, just a moment. Is? A Swiss bank.
you owe me. I don't owe you a thing. Huh? Remember this? Oh, you do remember these, do you? Huh. Yeah. I could hurt you in that courtroom, remember that? After all, not often you get someone up in front of a jury for murder. Hey, Who's already written about doing it in her diary? Everybody wants to hear about you. I could get 20 grand of my story from newspapers tomorrow, just like that. And I could tell them a few things, couldn't I, Annie? Eh? That changed, do you, Des? You'll always be the same low-life pimp. If you mess me around, Des, I'll kill you. Yeah? Well, just like you did to Hartley, Annie. I don't know why you're reacting like this, you know? I mean, it's a key role in the tea. Scorer? Yes. For God's sake, Jeremy, I want to play. Oh. He'll be asking me to make the teas next. No, I was rather hoping Alex would do that. I don't suppose you'd mention it, would you? Do your own dirty work. So, what's it to be? <laughs> you're serious, aren't you? You really want to play. Why not? Well, because, you know, because... Because... Don't even say it, Jeremy. Not if you want to leave this building alive. But, I mean, can you, you know? I mean, you know, can you play? Yes. Yes. Bit. Oh. Really, I'm a Overarm? All right, then, but there'll be no special favours. No going soft on the ladies. Great charter, Ma. Viciously competitive. So am I, Jeremy. Why didn't she tell us about this? According to Ed's aunt, she didn't think they were important. She only found out the other day that her ex was taking them to the police. Peter's going to have a field day. You don't want to let him use them, are you? I'm not sure we can keep them out. Anyway, we might not want to. All in the Valley of Death, row of the 600. What are you doing today? Sesame Street song in a minute. What a beautiful day like this. Why didn't you come and see what your old man does for a living? Boring. Well, you might learn something. Dad. All right, suit yourself. Dad. Do you think Mum will move to France? I don't know yet, Matt. Be weird without her here. In the course of this trial, the prosecution will present you with a complete chain of events, every detail of which connects the defendant with this crime. It will take you from the nightclub where the defendant and Patrick Hutton met to the hotel to which they repaired. You will see them go up to Patrick Hutton's bedroom at 12.30 a.m. and you will see the defendant running from the hotel after three o'clock and most unusually the defendant kept diaries in which she recorded her intention to commit just such a crime as this diaries which you will be able to read miss lewis had in her possession a gold cigarette lighter 
that was subsequently identified by his wife as the property of the deceased. Did you discover anything else during your search of Miss Lewis's flat, Detective Inspector Wilson? Yes, one of my officers found a torn and blood-stained dress hidden in the bathroom. Did the defendant offer any explanation for her battered physical appearance or the state of her clothing? She made a statement saying that she met Mr. Patrick Hutton at a club the previous evening. She'd agreed to have sex with him in return for payment. On reaching his hotel room, they had a violent argument and he attacked her. She claimed she left the hotel around one o'clock in the morning and went to her home. Would you please look at Exhibit A, Dr. Markham? In your judgment, could Mr. Hutton's injuries have been inflicted with this ashtray? I would say so. The size and weight are entirely consistent with the injuries sustained. The dress had been ripped at the neckline and was bloodstained. Were you able to discover whose blood it was, Dr. Buxton? The primary grouping was Miss Lewis's, but there was a small secondary source. Did you identify its origin? Blood group and DNA testing showed that it was from the deceased Patrick Hutton. It's the cigarette lighter I gave to my husband on his 30th birthday. It has his initials engraved on it. Mrs. Hutton, did you speak to your husband on the night of September the 10th? Careful. Yes, I did. What was his mood? Exhilarated. He was delighted because he'd pulled off a deal he'd been working on for a long time. What was the last thing your husband said to you that night? He told me to give Barney, that's our youngest son, a hug for him. Steady on with the hearsay, Peter. Let it ride. Thank you, Mrs. Hutton. No questions, my lord. Thank you very much, Mrs. Hutton. But I haven't had a chance to clear his name. Mrs. Hutton. My husband would never have gone with the prostitute. He loved me. He was my husband. I knew him. She was very quiet in the cab. I didn't see her properly until she was paying. Real shock it was. She had a cut on her face and there was blood on her dress. I asked if she was all right, but she just scarpered. The lady you've described, can you see her in this court? Yes, sir, that's her in the dock. Mr. Hicks, what time was this? About three o'clock, I reckon. Do you have a better than average memory, Mr. Hicks? <laughs> Not according to my wife. <laughs> average, I'd say. About average. Mr. Hicks, when was your last night shift? Monday. Just four days ago. Mr. Hicks, <clears throat> could you describe each of your fares and the time they got into the cab for me, please? What, in order? If you wouldn't mind. Well, there was a foreign girl. That was Lancaster Gate to the Barbican, just gone ten. Family of four, gone up west about eleven. Then there was these two kids, um, <laughs> going to a club in Bloomsbury, and then there was a nurse uh, that was a long run to Clapham. And what time are we now? About two. Are you asking me or telling me, Mr Hicks? Well, I think it was about two. I can't remember the exact time of every fair. Can't you? You told the police and this court that Miss Lewis was in your cab at three o'clock that morning. You remember the unusual ones? We've established that you remember the passengers, Mr Hicks. It's the times that you're not sure of. Well, I thought it was three. But you can't say definitely that it was, can you? You can't swear that it wasn't five o'clock. Oh, I don't think it was as late as that. And you can't swear that it wasn't one o'clock either, can you? No, I can't say for definite that it wasn't.
Well, at least we're on the scoreboard. Kate? What's up? Nothing. Luke wants to break up. Why? He says that if I was still interested, I'd go to the same university as him. Well, he's not being very reasonable, is he? You've made all your plans. Maybe he feels insecure. Yeah, but I don't want to break up with him. When you were a little girl, and you got upset, I used to buy you an ice cream. What can I do for you now? Ice cream still helps. See you later, Matt! Matt! Gentlemen, could I remind you there'll be no mobile phones in the wicket? You call. Heads. Hope your forward defence is better than your legal one, James. We win. Well, bat. Good luck. Good luck, Jerry. Not now, Julia. This is a crisis. Just one over. It's all I ask. If the first three balls go for a six, fake an injury.
Are you okay for tomorrow? No worries. Mum's away and Dad's not back till tomorrow. Where's Lou? Uh, upstairs. Uh, oh, man. <laughs> That was a wonderful ball you got me with. Oh, pure luck. Not at all. It was a fast off-break, wasn't it? No, not really. It was pretty straight. You just left a gap between bat and pad. Did I? That was reckless. You played terribly well. Fantastic, really. I thought you were going to beat us single-handed. You're keen on cricket, then? Mad about it. I've got a complete set of wisdom. You might like to have a look later. Can't think of anything I'd enjoy more. <laughs> Incredible how women always go for the obvious ones, isn't it? You know, yeah. it's handsome, I suppose, in his way. But, you, you know, you'd, you'd, have, you'd have thought she'd have gone for something, you know, just a bit more meaningful, don't you think? Don't tell me you're letting the competition get to you, Jeremy. No, no. No. It's just that sometimes I think, well, how nice it must be for you. I have someone like Lizzie to go home to. How is she, anyway? Where is she? Something came up. You don't get tempted to chase the barmaid round the village green when you're off the leash? Too much of an old married man for that, Jeremy. It's not really my thing. Well, in your shoes, I'll probably be the same. Well, in the meantime, undaunted, I shall return to the fray. to put right. That carpet is ruined. Oh, it'll clean. Somebody should have been here. What you mean is I should have been here. Oh, that's ridiculous. No, you do. You think it's my fault. Deep down, you think the house and the kids are my patch and I should have been here to deal with it. All right, but let's face it. If you take this job, you're not going to be here at the weekend. And I can't drag Matt round Europe every Friday night. He's obviously not responsible enough to be left on his own. You haven't even asked if they've offered it to me yet. Did they? Yes. Yes, they did, as a matter of fact. I'm just frightened because I don't want to lose you. You don't have to worry. You really don't. Luke, can't you have just a little bit of faith in me? We'll hardly see each other. I mean, how do I know you're going to meet? What's going to What are you doing up at this hour? I thought I'd take you up on your offer, if it's still going. What offer? You know, getting a bit of work experience. Might fancy a career in law. You never know. You should have said that you were defending that woman that murdered Patrick Hutton. Everyone's talking about her. Allegedly murdered. You're as bad as the tabloid newspapers. This isn't just alternative daytime TV, Matt. If you come, you do it properly, and you think hard about what you see and hear. Sounds okay to me. We got back to the hotel at about 12.30. To be honest, Mr Hutton and I had both had a bit too much to drink. We'd been working on the deal for weeks. We overdid the celebrations a bit. Was Miss Lewis with you at this point? Yes, Mr. Hutton invited her along. 
Did you know who she was? No, she hardly spoke to me all night. It was Mr. Hutton she was interested in. And what happened then? Mr. Hutton went off with her. Do you know where they went? No, but I guessed it was to Patrick's room. Mr. Randall, do you remember anything else about that night? Yes. I had the room next to Mr. Hutton's. During the night, I was woken by what sounded like a violent argument. What did you do? Uh, I'm afraid I was too drunk to do anything. I went back to sleep. It's something I will always regret. Would you say that Mr. Hutton's behavior on the night of September the 10th was atypical? Yes, I would. Mr. Hutton was a family man, absolutely devoted to his wife and children. But he'd been under a lot of pressure. We'd had a drink or two, and I think that might have affected his judgment. Mr. Randall, how long had you been staying in a hotel while working on this deal? Since the Friday of the week before. But you weren't staying in the Caxton International all that week, were you? No, it was a different hotel. Why did you choose to move to the Caxton International for that last night? No particular reason. No particular reason. When you arrived at the hotel, did Mr. Hutton speak to anybody? Apart from a brief word with the duty manager, no. What did Mr. Hutton say to the duty manager, Mr. Day? Nothing much. Something like, oh, how are you, Bobby? They were obviously on sociable, even intimate terms, weren't they? Well, they seemed to know each other. Mr. Randall, I'll ask you again. Why did you choose to move to the Caxton International? It was because of Bobby Day and the personal services he provided, wasn't it? I wouldn't know. It wasn't the first time he'd been with a prostitute at that hotel, was it? You'd done all this before with him, hadn't you, Mr. Randall? I personally have never had anything to do with prostitutes. But Mr. Hutton did, didn't he? He might have done, yes. He might have done. And on these occasions, the women were supplied by Mr. Day, weren't they? I believe Pat and Day had an arrangement, yes. Was Mr. Day paid for his services as middleman? I assume there was some form of financial understanding between Pat and Mr. Day, yes. The difference being, on this occasion, Mr. Hutton brought the woman with him, didn't he? I suppose so. Normally, the women would arrive later. More than one? Sometimes. Mr. Randall, did Mr. Hutton have any enemies? Not to my knowledge. But he was a controversial figure whose ruthless business methods had long aroused considerable hostility, wasn't he? Well, that's your view, not mine. Why, then, did he employ a private bodyguard to watch over his personal safety? Given the attention Pat had received, particularly in the media over the years, it seemed a sensible precaution to hire a driver trained in security areas. Was his driver present that night? No, Pat let him go for the night when we got to the hotel. Did he always do that on these occasions? Yes, he did. So, <clears throat> Mr. Hutton was in the habit of allowing complete strangers into his hotel room in the dead of night without any regard for his own personal safety. He was a very confident man. Anything could have happened in that hotel room after my client left, couldn't it? No, because Pat was dead. Mr. Day, when did you first see the defendant on the night of September the 10th? She came in at about 12.30. I had a brief conversation with Mr. Hutton, and then they took the lift together. Did you see Anne Lewis again that night? Yes. Uh, I was in reception. I looked up and saw her running across the lobby. As she went out through the main doors. Are you sure it was her? Oh, there's no doubt in my mind. I only saw her from behind, but it was definitely her. And you say she was running? Yes. Yes, there was something panicky about it. Running away might be a better way of putting it. What time was this? 
just after three o'clock. It's a bloody lie. If you cannot control yourself, Miss Lewis, you will be taken down. Are you certain that was the time yesterday? Yes. Yes, I am. I remember looking at my watch. Mr. Day, in your statement to the police, you said that Mr. Hutton had stayed at your hotel in the past, that you recognized him, but that was the extent of your acquaintanceship. Is that correct? Yes, that is what I said. But that wasn't entirely true, was it? Yes, it was. Mr. Hutton called you Bobby when he arrived at the hotel, didn't he? I dare say he might have heard of the staff using my name. And you knew him well enough to protest to him when he brought a woman back to the hotel, didn't you? And you knew who that woman was, didn't you? I knew what type of woman she was. What type was that? A prostitute. I put it to you, Mr. Day, that the reason you objected to her coming into the hotel was that she was not one of your prostitutes. You have a lucrative sideline in arranging girls for clients, don't you? I deny that. What do you deny? That this was the reason you objected to her, or that you arrange prostitutes? I deny that I arrange for prostitutes to ply their trade in my hotel. You have never done that? Never. I put it to you, Mr. Day, that the reason you tried to stop Ms. Lewis coming into your hotel was that she would not give you a cut of her earnings from business you put her way. That's right, isn't it? I haven't the slightest idea what you're talking about. Haven't you? Mr. Randall has just told this court that you arrange girls for clients at this hotel, a service you have performed in the past for Mr. Hutton. Then he is mistaken. That's absolute rubbish. He's just making that up, is he? He must be. It's your word against his. Yes. You told my learned friend that it was three o'clock when you saw Miss Lewis leaving the hotel, didn't you? Yes. She says it was one o'clock. She's lying. Your word against hers. Yes. Lizzie? Mm -hmm. Did you ever keep a diary? Frantically, when I was a teenager. What kind of stuff did you put in it? Best and the worst. Things I wouldn't tell anybody else. Are you coming to bed? In a minute. There's just one or two things I want to go over. Mr. Carter, how did you come to be in possession of these diaries? Well, uh... And he left them behind when she walked out on me. Did she keep a diary regularly? Well, she was always scribbling away when we first met. Not so much towards the end. Did you know at the time what was in these diaries? No. I only happened to read them a couple of weeks ago. And what did you do? Well, <laughs> I went straight to the police. Why did you do that? Well, because of what's in them. I mean, uh, you know, I couldn't sleep at night if I kept quiet about what's in these diaries. I see. Mr. Carter, could you um, please take the 1989 diary and read from the entry Miss Lewis made on June the 5th of that year? <clears throat> They're all liars and cheats, all the husbands and fathers, all so bloody re respectable. But underneath the same stinking 
hypocrites. One day I'd like to get one and do him, just like slaughtering an animal. I'll wait until he's asleep and then stick the bastard in the gut. And I want him to wake up then, so the last thing he sees is me watching him bleed to death. I bet all the girls feel the same. It would be brilliant if someone took a punter and cut him up. Let's look at some alternative entries in this diary, Mr. Carter. Could you please read from September the 12th, 1988? <clears throat> Had flu. Told Des I couldn't go out. Gave me one of his little talks. Work nights bridge later, 280 pounds. What did she mean by a little talk, Mr. Carter? I don't know what she's talking about. Mr. Carter, throughout the period of your relationship with Ms. Lewis, you repeatedly assaulted her in order to make her earn money for you as a prostitute, didn't you? No. No, I paid her rent. I bought her gear. She done all right out of me. If she don't want to be a tight, how come she's still doing it now, eh? How long were you and Ms. Lewis living together? I don't know, about four years. Uh, from 87. There were no violent fantasies before 1987, were there? Don't know. There might be. Well, you've read them. Find them for us. Well, I can't see nothing, no, but... They don't start, do they, before she met you? Well, I don't see what that's got to do with anything. Well, some people might think, Mr Carter, that the violent fantasies were directly linked to the time you spent with Miss Lewis, mightn't they? It's got nothing to do with me. Have you agreed to sell your story to the newspapers at the conclusion of this trial? No. No, actually. That is not true. That is not true. They've approached me, yeah. But I told them, I told, I told them I weren't interested. And that concludes the case for the prosecution, my lord. He made it clear he wanted me from the moment I walked in. He made a big thing about not using his full name. I knew who he was. I knew he didn't go with him. Something about his mood I didn't like. I've seen it before. It wasn't just sex he was interested in. He wanted to hurt me, use me, prove a point. After we'd fixed the price, he talked a bit about his wife. And then he went mad. He hit me. He tore my dress and he threw me on the floor and then he hit me again. He started punching and, and slapping me and, and calling me all the usual names like bitch and slag. Um, I struggled as hard as I could. I think I hit him because his nose was bleeding. Some of the blood must have got on my dress. He put his hand to his nose and I got to the door and ran out. Can you explain how Patrick Hutton's cigarette lighter came to be in your possession? Yes, I stole it. Why? It's just a way of letting the punters know what I really think about them. Mr Hutton's briefcase was missing too. Did you steal that? No. Did you steal his wallet? No. Can you explain how your fingerprints came to be on the glass ashtray in Mr Hutton's room? Yes. I had a cigarette while I was waiting for him to get changed. I must have touched it then. Miss Lewis, why did you keep a diary? To begin with, for the same reason that everybody else does. Just to keep a few secrets, kids' things, ordinary stuff. On September the 12th, 1988, you wrote that Des had come back and you had agreed to do as he suggested. What had he suggested? 
that I go on the game to earn some money. I didn't want to do it. I had a row. I was frightened he was going to leave me, so... In the end, I said I would. He said it, it would only be for a while. Why didn't you just leave him? I don't know. To begin with, I still thought that I needed him. And later on, I, I was just frightened of what he might do. Why did you write about killing men in your diaries, Miss Lewis? Because I was sick of feeling scared. Somehow imagining doing something like that made me feel safer, more powerful. It was a safety valve, that's all. It never meant I was actually going to do it. Could you read me one final extract from the diary, Miss Lewis? Um, August the 7th, 1990. Tracy is one month today. She is the most beautiful thing I've ever seen. The only good thing in my life. One day, when I've made enough money, I'll take her with me somewhere else, to another town, or maybe even another country. Away from all this, anyway. Thank you, Miss Lewis. Miss Lewis, if you didn't take Mr. Hutton's briefcase and wallet, who did? I have no idea. This story of an unprovoked attack by Mr. Hutton, it's not true, is it? Yes, it is. What actually happened is you waited until he was asleep, and then you set about stealing his belongings. But he woke and surprised you, didn't he? No. There was a struggle during which you received your injuries, but he was sleepy and defenseless, and in the end, you picked up the ashtray and, driven by fear and hatred, you beat him to death, didn't you? No. When I left him, he was alive. I don't know how he died. Mr. Hutton represented everything you hate and detest in men, didn't he? He was arrogant and brutal, if that's what you mean. And that enraged you, didn't it? No. Not anymore. Might have done once. You mean in the days when you were writing in your diary about taking your revenge on the men who abused you? Yes. That was only a few years ago, wasn't it? Yes. And you still have the same self-pitying vision of yourself as some sort of victim, and you still want your revenge, self don't you? Pity? I've been beaten up more times than I can remember by men. I've been raped and half strangled smashed in the face with a bottle. Every time I go out, I wonder if tonight's the night I end up dead in an alley somewhere. You do hate and fear men, don't you? Yes, I do. With good reason. You hated and feared Patrick Hutton that night. Yes, I did. And that is why you killed him, isn't it? I wanted to kill him. When he started hitting me, I wanted to see him dead. He deserved it. I would never have had a single moment's guilt or, or, or regret if I'd done it. I wanted to kill him. I didn't. When I opened this case to you, I told you the prosecution would provide you with a complete chain of evidence. Having heard this evidence, you will see that every link of the chain is in place, and it connects this defendant to the crime down to the last detail. Mr. Hutton was killed by blows from an ashtray. The ashtray in his hotel room was covered in his blood.
The fingerprints of the accused were on the ashtray, and Mr. Hutton's blood was on her dress. These final links in the chain, evidence that clearly ties the defendant to this crime at every stage, point in only one direction, to a verdict of guilty. I am going to suggest to you that every single link in my learned friend's chain of evidence is fragile. He put forward Mr. Hutton as a devoted family man caught out in a moment of weakness. But he was wrong about that, wasn't he? Mr. Hutton was a risk taker, a man whose ruthless business methods made him enemies who needed a bodyguard, and yet habitually consorted with prostitutes, recklessly exposing himself to danger. You are not required to ask yourselves who killed Patrick Hutton. It may have been a business rival, his briefcase was missing, remember? Or it may have been another prostitute. He frequently entertained more than one. What you have to decide is whether you believe, beyond reasonable doubt, that Anne Lewis was his killer, beyond reasonable doubt. And I suggest to you that for each of my learned friends' so-called links, the fingerprints on the ashtray, the blood on her dress, even the diary entries and the disputed timing of her departure from the hotel, there are entirely convincing explanations which you have heard. Members, of the jury. Is this a perfect chain? She put up a good show, James. So did you. When it comes to crime, I'm bound to admit I've always been a bit... a bit of a tortoise next to your hair. Maybe. But then again, we all know who won that particular race. Hmm. Have you reached a verdict on which you all agree? Yes. Do you find the defendant, Anne Sharon Lewis, guilty or not guilty of murder? Not guilty. Who did it, Dad? You may be right, Matt. I don't know. But aren't you curious? I can't allow myself the luxury. As it turned out, the evidence wasn't enough to convict her, and that's my job done. The rest is for the police.
I want you to tell me what you said at the trial wasn't true. Tell me my husband wasn't like that, that he didn't do those things to you. Tell me you made it up to save yourself. I don't care if you did kill him. I won't tell anyone. Just tell me you were lying. Sorry. You've had a wasted journey. Seems so clear to you in the courtroom. You can see everything, no doubts, no uncertainties. You always know exactly where you are, but it doesn't work that way in life, does it? There's a British Airways flight every hour on Fridays going both ways. You mean you don't mind? Mind? The way I look at it, the happier and more fulfilled you are, the stronger we are together. Being apart isn't going to touch that. If you didn't take this chance, you'd never forgive yourself or me. And we'd just be feeding the fear and insecurity we thought we were avoiding. I think that's my speech, isn't it? If you were listening very carefully, there was an apology in there somewhere. <sighs> Poor Kate. I wish I could tell her it gets easier. Thank you. 